The Netherlands is a nation characterized by land situated below sea level, leading the Dutch to have a long-standing relationship with the ebb and flow of the tides. Since the land cannot be relocated, the inhabitants of this region have developed innovative ways to coexist with water, embodying a distinctly Dutch approach to managing their unique topology. When you visit Amsterdam, the capital of the Netherlands, one of the most striking sights is the sheer quantity of bicycles. In the city itself, there are over a million bicycles, outnumbering the population of approximately 900,000. Across the nation, there are a staggering 23 million bicycles, exceeding the entire population. It's estimated that every Dutch citizen across all genders, ages, social statuses and professions owns a bicycle. Hello, good morning. So you come with the bike? Yes, nice with to your meet you. With your high heel, nice to yes. meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> How can you nice manage wearing high heel and ride a bicycle at the same Hi. time? Really? <laughs> yes, I do it every day. Wow, with skirt? With skirts and high heels. With respect, you know. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but actually, it's quite normal here. Really? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes with two babies, sometimes with dogs, sometimes with big Everything luggage. goes on the bike. Right. All the shopping, all the people. Oh. kids. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know that it's so much. And your loved much. one goes on the back? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we cycling a uh, few days already with our camera and everything. Yeah. And I so was a little bit... how are you bit, finding it? I was a little bit nervous when we started, but then after a while, it was fine. You know, I was so afraid that I'm going to, you know, drop my camera or gears, but it's totally fine. Good. Scenes like these were not part of the original landscape. Prior to World War II, the Dutch predominantly relied on bicycles for transport, in line with the economic and societal norms of that era. Nevertheless, in the 1950s and 60s, there was a rapid surge in the number of automobiles, and the cyclists found their space diminishing due to the encroachment of cars. In the historic towns, the narrow, cobbled streets were ill-suited to larger vehicles, leading to the removal of some old buildings to create room for cars. The use of automobiles has been associated with a significant number of fatalities. In 1971, a tragic 3,000 lives were lost, with over 450 of those being children. This devastating statistic prompted the emergence of social movements most notably Stop the Child Murder, as protesters demanded safer roads. These calls for action didn't fall on deaf ears. Simultaneously, the world oil market was grappling with soaring prices. In response, the Dutch government shifted its focus to reducing energy dependence, particularly on foreign oil, and took steps to create a safer road infrastructure for all, with a specific emphasis on safeguarding children. This commitment to change extended from the national to the local level, gradually fostering a culture of cycling. As a result, the bicycle has become an integral part of Dutch life once again. This is the Amsterdam of today, a city where people ride bicycles everywhere be it sunny, cloudy, windy, or even during a downpour. Here you'll see seamless communication among cyclists. Everyone knows when to turn and when to go straight, so they navigate harmoniously. The thriving bicycle culture in the Netherlands owes much to an environment which promotes everyday cycling. This philosophy resonates with the Dutch concept, build a bicycle lane first and cyclists will follow. So this is one of our biggest crossings in bikes, 40, 50,000 cyclists per day. Right. But what you see is that we had, we had problems here because people couldn't uh, fit anymore in the, in the bike lane and we couldn't get enough people through the lights. Right. So there was actually, people were saying that it was a, a, a bicycle traffic jam because they couldn't get through the lights the first time it got green, which is, you know, everybody's used to that in Amsterdam, that if you're on a bike, the first time you go green, you go through, everybody goes through. 
So we decided to make this a lot bigger than it was before. And, but we didn't have so much space because right. we also want to have the olive trees, we also want to have the pedestrians. Mm. This, is a, this is a historic site. So what we did is that we, we didn't change the size so much, but we changed the, um, the way the space is divided. Right. So here you see that the cyclists have a lot of space, I see. but where they're going, they have a smaller hole to get into and that's because you have fast cyclists and slower cyclists right. so by the time they are at the other end of the crossing they've all gone like this and the other way it's exactly the same so you you have the traffic light for the bike as you have for the car yeah we do so i think the basic rule is that when it's red you stop it's red. <laughs> <laughs> that's for cars and cyclists it's the same okay <laughs> And we have, so what we do is that uh, there's a countdown. Right. Uh, there's a, it's in the corner. Okay. And you can actually see when you are going to get the green lights. Right. Now this idea was uh, thought up because we wanted to stop the amount of people going through the red lights. Oh, before you don't have the countdown. We didn't right? have them. And, uh, and we thought, well, we will experiment with this measure to see if less people go through the red light, if they know that they only have to wait 30 seconds. The bicycle lanes are meticulously separated, with surfaces as smooth as airport runways, devoid of potholes or uneven sections. Dedicated traffic lights for cyclists enhance safety, while the lanes are spacious enough for riders to move side by side and overtake when necessary. In areas lacking designated bicycle lanes or intersections, Shared spaces prioritize bicycles. Cyclists benefit from protection in case of accidents. By law, if you as a car driver hit a cyclist, right. in general, the, the car driver, it will be his fault, mm -hmm. his or her fault. Even they go through the red light? Uh, yes, even if they go through the red light. But uh, there are instances where there is ruled otherwise. But in general, so the basic rule is that the, uh, the bicycle is has the way right of way yeah right. because they are because they are the uh, most vulnerable so, so the rule is that the most vulnerable has the most rights the cycling environment is so safe that wearing helmets is not obligatory the fact that you're not wearing a helmet uh, sends a signal that you are uh, that it is safe to right. cycle it's not something that you have to be scared of. You don't need to be frightened of... Uh... And I think that there's also a practicality to it, because if you would... Uh... So a helmet can definitely help you if you fall, but in a major or a serious accident, you're going to get killed anyway on a bike. And the helmet is not going to prevent you from getting killed. If you get hit by a car at 60 kilometers an hour or 50, that's not good with or without the helmet. So I think there's also a sort of pragmatic thing for, for the Dutch people. Apart from the extensive network of secure bicycle lanes which spans the nation, there's also widespread and abundant availability of bicycle parking facilities. This is an Amsterdam bicycle parking area, one of many such locations, with additional construction currently underway. The newly constructed facilities are expansive, spacious, and provide free parking. Given the road congestion and the exorbitant parking costs, it's hardly surprising that Amsterdam has transformed into a cyclist's paradise. Bicycle culture plays a pivotal role in the substantial decrease in accident-related fatalities. The annual average of automobile-related deaths, which stood at around 3,000 in the 1970s, has significantly reduced to an average of around 600 per year. Yet another reason for the widespread cycling culture is the favourable topographical features that make cycling a breeze. The Netherlands boasts a predominantly flat landscape. It's often humorously quipped that you can stand on a chair and see the entire Netherlands, as there are no elevated terrain or mountains in sight. This nation is situated on the delta plains of four of Europe's major rivers, 
with approximately two-thirds of the country lying below sea level. The lowest point in the Netherlands lies 6.76 metres below sea level, while the highest point is a mere 323 metres above sea level. The contrast between land and water levels is readily apparent to the eye. Apart from its location at the river's mouth, the Netherlands is bounded by the North Sea to the north and west. The coastal regions often experience storm surges, leading to frequent floods that have tragically taken many lives. As a result, the ability to swim is considered vital for all Dutch citizens. Water presents both advantages and challenges for the Dutch. It facilitates the country's thriving shipping and trade sectors, but it also carries the risk of flooding. Consequently, people here have learned to coexist with water. The Netherlands water management system has been established for centuries and has evolved with technological advancements. In ancient times, the Dutch began by constructing dikes to shield against water, and this practice evolved over time. Today, the iconic windmills of the Netherlands are used to pump water from inundated areas. Amsterdam serves as an extraordinary illustration of the Dutch ability to coexist with water. The city has a defence line, which is a 135 kilometer ring of fortifications encircling the city. It was constructed in the 18th century and was designed as an addition to the Dutch water line. The Dutch water line was a strategic defence system that was used to control flooding of the surrounding land to deter invasion. The canals also play a vital role in water drainage, while the sluices ensure a stable and predictable water level throughout the city. As such, a significant number of residents in this city are able to make their homes on the water. This is 52 years old, so people in Amsterdam are always living on the water and the boat. Yeah. It's part of a culture, isn't it? Yeah, it is, because we don't have space, enough, enough space for all the people who want to live here. So, like, uh, yeah, around 50 years ago, they started to live on the water, like in a real ship. Uh -huh. And um, more and more ships came where people were living on. And then when a ship was too old to live on, they replaced it by an ark. So this is like an ark, as you can see, because it's, it's uh, like ah, a okay. big shoebox. Right. You call this an ark, but there are also people living on a ship. Right. And sometimes they even sail with the ship. So when you said you're buying a house, a boat house, mean you actually buying the space on the water, right? You, well, you buy the house, uh -huh. you buy the boat, and you can use the water. But the water is not ours. We use it from the government. Okay. Yeah. So the which property belong to you? In the boat. This case? The only boat. the boat. And but and we we are the only ones who who are allowed to use this piece of uh, land. So it's not that the neighbor's coming, okay, now I'm going to use it. The Amsterdam Canal Ring, initiated in the early 17th century, comprises a network of canals that were excavated to the west and south of the old and medieval port city. The canal system forms a circular configuration and is distinguished by the reclamation of wetlands to establish elevated areas for the construction of communities. This pioneering urban planning approach set a benchmark for city planning globally, extending its influence until the 19th century. In recognition of its historical and architectural significance, the Amsterdam Canal Ring was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2010. This designation celebrates the city's urban development and industrial evolution during the 17th century. On the night of February the 1st, 1953, the Netherlands experienced a pivotal moment. Unusual spring tides, coupled with northwestern storms, resulted in an exceptionally high sea level, accompanied by powerful coastal surges preceding their collision with the shore. Over 4.9 meters of water inundated the region, causing widespread devastation and tragically claiming the lives of nearly 2,000 people. Approximately 9% of the country was severely affected by catastrophic flooding. 
This crisis served as a turning point for the Netherlands, prompting the initiation of a significant enhancement to its water management system, known as the Delta Works. Deltaris, an independent institute for applied research in the field of water, subsurface and infrastructure, conducts research and designs water barriers, floodgates and revetments. These are the fundamental mechanisms used to mitigate and prevent flooding. The function of our dikes, dams and dunes is to, to um, hold, the river, hold all the water in our river system. Um, we don't want, or at least from the old days, we don't want the water to go into our poles because that's below, that lies below sea level. Um, and it's all interconnected with each other, the whole system, just to make sure that the water entering from the German side flows to the coast, uh, coastline. Currently, uh, most effort is uh, taken in the, the, in the river systems so or along the major rivers. Uh, most of our dike reinforcement is taking place there in the coming decades uh, because last year we uh, finalized one of our weak links along the coast, uh, coastline of the Netherlands. So we say now that the coastline is super storm proof, but our rivers are uh, not yet super storm proof, so we're now undertaking a lot of actions for that. And the way we um, reinforce dikes is to, to look at several failure mechanisms, a way of uh, how a dike can breach. And we have several, um, at least five major uh, failure mechanisms for that. And um, in the last couple of years, we've done a lot of research on to gain more insight on how the failure mechanisms work and how we can um, strengthen our, our dikes. And normally, when it's just a dike with a green area around it, we make it higher and a bit wider and with a, with a slope. Um, but in some areas that's not possible um, because the houses are located close uh, behind, uh, behind the dike. And then we use more uh, constructions like sheet piles. Um, and at this very moment we're also trying to find new um, product innovations, more te new technical innovations um, where we strengthen our dikes. Um, so it's more, uh, the cost benefit analysis is more uh, appropriate. Beyond their flood protection measures and harmonious relationship with water, the Netherlands possesses extensive expertise in water management, particularly in reclaiming previously waterlogged regions. The northern part of the country was once an enclosed lake, but it was deliberately inundated by seawater, merging the areas together. Dutch engineers constructed a dam to keep the sea at bay. Once the dam was finished, it required more than 10 years to drain the water and an additional decade to allow the land to dry sufficiently for human habitation. The saying, God created the world, but the Dutch created the Netherlands, may seem metaphorical, but it's quite apt given the remarkable transformations in this country. A full third of the Netherlands was shaped by the construction of dams and subsequent drainage of the land. Another compelling illustration is Schiphol Airport, a major international airport in the Netherlands. For those arriving in the Netherlands by air and disembarking at this airport, it might come as a surprise to know that the very location was once a vast lake. This area sits at a depth of four meters below sea level. This is the machinery that converted the extensive water body into a bustling airport and fertile agricultural land. The hydraulic apparatus operated for three years to drain the water from the area. What's happening now? The machine is going down. Mm. The water will be pumped up. Oh, okay. It will be pumped up out of the lake. Right. It will be thrown over the edge mm -hmm. into the draining part. Mm. Yeah? And the draining part is outside. Right. And from the draining part, it's going into the ring vat, into the ring canal. And it takes three years to pump the water out where the skip hole airport. All the three pumping stations, yeah, has been working for three years all together, yeah, to get this large lake empty. The development of hydraulic machinery for drainage, serving both agriculture and settlements, began in the Middle Ages and persists to the present day. It forms an integral component of a comprehensive water management system, encompassing dikes, reservoirs, pumping stations, administrative structures and arrays of wind turbines. 
These machines epitomize the sustained efforts of Dutch engineers and architects to safeguard both the populace and the land against the ever-present natural forces of water, both today and in the coming years. This significance is notably highlighted on a day when the Netherlands is experiencing the consequences of global temperature changes, manifesting in rising sea levels and altered rainfall patterns. What the government does by uh, keeping the dike strong and higher them up sometimes because of the rising of the sea level. Uh, we have dunes at the coast, they, they, they're working on it every year, so they put new sand on it to make it a little bit higher, or the sand that blew away to, put, to place it back, new sand. I think in the recent decades we have seen that climate change is occurring. We see in the Netherlands that uh, we have more intensive rainfall, uh, causing all um, some difficulties for the inhabitants in the Netherlands. We have to react on and anticipate on, because we, did not sh we are not sure what is going to happen, um, and we have to look ahead and try to at least make the Netherlands livable as we are be living below sea level. In a country where over two-thirds of the land and a population of over nine million people exist below sea level, the Dutch continually innovate to coexist with water. While the Delta Works project has made significant strides in safeguarding the nation, achieving absolute water safety remains a challenge. Beyond natural threats to their diminishing land, the Netherlands must grapple with the demands of a growing population, which necessitates more living space and resources. The commitment to residing on water permeates every facet and dimension of life in this place. In the Netherlands, cycling goes beyond being a fleeting trend or a simple exercise, and windmills are more than picturesque landmarks for tourist postcards. Living on a boat isn't merely a desire for proximity to water, it's a way of life and a fundamental requirement for living in the Netherlands.